Hello, everyone. I'm sorry not to be able to be there with you in person for this uh, remarkable occasion of celebrating the accomplishments of the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA. But I wanted to share a few thoughts with you about the legacy of this project. Uh, so this video is the closest I could come since I'm on the other side of the country right now. I entitled this The Big Bang for Cancer Precision Medicine because it does seem that what it took to go from the idea of whole genome analysis of cancer to the reality that was TCGA. So it kind of was the Big Bang. Although some people hearing about this talk thought maybe I was going to be discussing something about Jim Parsons and the Big Bang on the television screen. Well, I have had the privilege of getting to know him a little bit. He was the moderator of our wonderful special on Discovery Channel uh, called First in Human that describes some of the exciting things that are going on, including in cancer research at the NIH Clinical Center. But no, it's not that Big Bang. It's more like this Big Bang. Now, some of you are wondering, who is that? Well, those who've been around a little while may in fact be quickly able to identify this individual as the first person who actually advocated for the Genome Project. That was Renato Dolbeco. And his argument was not about germline mutations. It was about somatic changes. And he was saying, we need a genome project for cancer. We have to sequence the human genome, and then we have to understand more about how mutations in that genome result in this disease. That was a big deal. 1986, the first real public call for a mounted effort to read out all of those billions of base pairs in the human genome. And of course, that was a bit controversial, to put it mildly at the time. But over the next four years, uh, with a lot of thought and effort going into this, we did, in fact, see in the U.S. and with international partners, the launching of the Human Genome Project. And so over the course of the next 13 years, 1990 to 2003, pushing back the technology to go from what used to be really clunky DNA sequencing involving, oh my gosh, radioactive gels and everything else, uh, moving that forward to the point where a thousand base pairs could be turned out every second in the sequencing machines across the world. I had the privilege of serving as the project manager, or maybe it was the field general, or I don't know what you want to call it, of organizing this effort of those 20 laboratories in six countries. But out of that emerged the first reference sequence for the human genome. Well, that was a big deal. But of course, it was a start because we didn't know how to read that language very well. And we wanted to figure out ways to apply it for medical purposes. And where better than in a disease that we knew intimately involved the genome, namely cancer? So arguments were put forward very quickly by people uh, like myself and many others about how cancer genomics uh, ought to be a major next area of emphasis. The Human Genome Project providing a reference, also providing a whole lot of information about gene families that might be important drug targets, kinases and so on. Technologies that had come along which made it possible to begin to tackle cancer genomes with all of their rearrangements and mutations in ways that we couldn't have been able to do uh, until those technologies were invented. And already emerging from this effort, discovering uh, particular genes that were critical, maybe BRAF point uh, particularly is a great example for melanoma, and realizing if that could work, it could probably work in a lot of places. So on we went to try to figure out how would you do this. Now, let me say, at the beginning, the idea of a cancer genomics project was not widely embraced by everybody. The big concern was there would be so much somatic noise from random mutations in a cancer cell that you'd have an impossible time trying to sort out which of these are actually causative and therefore are pointing towards pathways and potential treatments. The answer to that, of course, was you got to do a lot of cancers and you've got to look for an emerging theme. So in 2003, the same year that the Genome Project concluded, we began to think about how this would look and launched at least the concept of a cancer genomics project. There were huge challenges. Even though many tumor samples had been collected down through the decades, the harder you looked at the samples that were there, the more you realized that they probably weren't going to be sufficient. Consents weren't adequate. The way in which the samples had been obtained was insufficient. Oftentimes, there was no blood sample to look at the germline. 
it looked as if what we had hoped would be the easy part, just getting all those archive samples together, was actually going to be the hard part, at least front end. And there was this issue about signal to noise, and that meant we had to do lots and lots of samples for a given tumor type, at least 250, maybe 500, if you were really going to be sure <clears throat> that you were seeing the themes that mattered. And then a vast amount of data that we would want to get from all of these, and maybe not just DNA sequence, but RNA expression, epigenomics. And then finally, all the cultures that had to be brought together from clinical oncologists, who are the ones who are going to provide access to all these samples, uh, to engineers and technologists who are developing the newest ways to be able to analyze the samples, and everything in between. Not a trivial problem, but that's what we do at NIH. We find identical, we find opportunities like this, and we figure out how to go after them. So here's what happened. In September 2003, uh, the NCAB of the Cancer Institute formed an ad hoc committee. The Genome Institute and NCI worked together on a workshop in April 2004. Uh, that then moved forward, more specific presentations to executive committees and BSAs and NCABs, and a working group was identified, and there was a meeting for broad input. I was engaged in most of these as being at the time the director of NHGRI. And ultimately, by 2005 or so, it looked like we were developing a real project. And we did. And a little bit after that got started, Anna Barker, who is a significant lead from the NCI, and I wrote this piece in Scientific American, sort of laying out a vision of where this might take us. And um, uh, it's sort of interesting to go back and look at it because it didn't turn out too differently than what we had hoped 11 years ago might come from this, except it's been even more significant as far as its impact. Uh, we were glad in that particular Scientific American to also have a guest contributor to a small uh, commentary, and none other than Renato Del Becco himself, <laughs> coming back to this 21 years after his original clarion call uh, for the cancer genome, saying the time has really come to get a truly comprehensive catalog of the genes involved in cancer. So that's what TCGA set out to do. Uh, once the plan was in place, how do you actually implement it? And what an incredible challenge that was and what amazing people got on board to make it happen. Some of you may remember those very first three cancers that we chose, glioblastoma multiforme, squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, and serous cyst adenocarcinoma of the ovary. Uh, were chosen carefully because they were clearly cancers where need was great uh, to find new potential targets, and also where we thought with big efforts we could find the specimens and get the effort underway. So with a core resource of biospecimens, cancer genomic characterization centers, uh, seven in number, sequencing centers, three of those, a data coordinating center, it was a big complicated enterprise, and lots of multiple data types, this got underway. And some of those early meetings, whoa, they were pretty interesting as we all tried to figure out what are we going to do with all this data and how are we going to make sense out of it? And a whole wonderful new cohort of bioinformatics experts uh, came on board uh, to make that kind of vision come true. And over the, now the last dozen years, uh, the way in which this has moved forward is truly gratifying. That first effort uh, from the pilot project producing publications uh, on glioblastoma uh, that you see here, just three of many that happened just in the first few years, uh, teaching us things we didn't know before, which is what we really hoped would come out of this. The value was demonstrated. And now look and see what happened over the course of the coming years. I'm just going to show you here those projects on particular cancer types that resulted in major milestone publications, beginning with glioblastoma multiforme in 2008, ovarian cancer 2011, 2012, things really starting to happen here, uh, rectal cancer, lung squamous cell, colon, breast, ductal, and lobular cancer, 2013, renal cell carcinoma, AML, endometrial carcinoma, 2014, urothelial bladder carcinoma, uh, renal cell carcinoma, the chromophobe type, uh, lung adeno CA, stomach adeno CA, thyroid carcinoma, 15 going on, head and neck, kidney, lower grade glioma, prostate cancer, melanoma, 16 adrenocortical carcinoma, 17, wow, it was a big year, cervical cancer, cholangiocarcinoma, esophageal carcinoma, liver, pancreatic, paraganglioma, sarcomas, uterine carcinoma, and uveal melanoma, all of those in one year, and 2018, still not done yet, 
testicular germ cell cancer, thymoma, mesothelioma, now under review, but likely to get published by the end of this year. 33 tumor types for which we have data for the ages about how these particular cancers can be characterized by a detailed analysis of what's happening in their genomes, in their transcriptomes. So by the numbers, pretty impressive here, two and a half petabytes of data. Um, you can see what the perspective is there about how many DVDs that would be, uh, 212,000. Uh, data describing 33 different tumor types, as I said, including 10 rare cancers, 11,000 patients represented, and using seven different data types, not just genome uh, uh, sequence of the tumor itself, but much other information that informs us about function. A pretty amazing record over the course of these dozen years. Well, this, of course, is only useful if people have access to it. And so the Pan-Cancer Atlas, as one of the many ways in which this information is finding its way into the hands of researchers, uh, has also been an important flag flagship of this enterprise. And we'll chart our way forward as more and more of this evidence collects. So I have to say, looking back on where we came from, uh, this is further than I thought we would be in 2018. And I also have to say, while the NIH has been in a role here as a leader of this enterprise, we had lots of partners, and they deserve a lot of credit. The International Cancer Genome Consortium started 10 years ago, 84 projects, 16 jurisdictions, uh, contributing specially important data about cancer types that occur in parts of the world at a higher frequency than they do in the U.S., and therefore, we've learned about them too. All of this coordinated really in a wonderful way by people who decided not to worry too much about who got the credit. Let's just get the work done and let's get the data out there where people can start to use it. And they are using it. Just as one example, we would not be in the position we are now talking about precision medicine for cancer without the data that enhances that ability to pick the right drug for the right patient. And that means having that cancer genomic information and knowing what targets are out there that has now found its way into clinical practice and into this remarkable trial called MATCH, which aims to try to test that theory out and for which data is already coming forward saying, yes, it does matter. Multiple treatment arms targeting specific mutations and then patient matched to the study arm based upon the tumor sequence. Results from three study arms already published uh, just recently in the space of uh, the last couple of months. I would also say cancer immunotherapy, which everyone is now enormously excited about given the reach that this seems to have into both liquid tumors and solid tumors, is greatly advantaged by what's possible because of cancer genomic information, including increasingly now the ability to optimize the treatment for that patient based on their specific cancer collection of antigens that are being generated as the result uh, of mutations. And I have to just because it's timely here, also give a big shout out to the way in which cancer immunotherapy is uh, right now being honored by the awarding of the Albany Medical Center Prize uh, to Steve Rosenberg, Jim Allison, and Carl June, all of whom are very much at the forefront uh, of this effort of taking what we've learned from TCGA into the immunotherapy arena and seeing how it could do truly dramatic things, even for patients who have metastatic disease that in the past we thought uh, had pretty much run out of options. Not anymore. So I wanted to put all those things in front of you. I am sure there are lots of speakers who in the course of today will present exciting new data, will have reflections on where we've been and where we're going. But just as a setting of the stage, those are some thoughts. And I guess, where does the future take us? I don't know. I wouldn't have known back in 2003 when we started talking about this what it would be like 15 years later, and I probably don't know what it's going to be like 15 years from now or even five years from now. But maybe that's not the job that we have as people trying to promote our understanding of cancer. Part of it is not necessarily to predict it. It's to enable it. And I think that's what this wonderful quote from the guy who wrote The Little Prince always reminds me of, that when it comes to that future, we're not that good at foreseeing it, but we can identify ways in which the work that we do can enhance the progress to enable a future that is going to benefit more people. That's what I see TCGA has done. 
It's created this universe of possibilities, starting back at that Big Bang and now turning into a wealth of information with countless applications that are going to save many lives. So my congratulations uh, to all those who've been engaged in this. We should, in fact, take this moment to realize what a significant contribution this has made. It will be written about in the history books, I think, when the story of cancer is written 100 years from now. And yet, let's enjoy the celebration and then get back to work because the real future of making this into something that will affect the lives of everybody with cancer is a work that's still in progress and there's much more to be done. So thank you all and have a wonderful symposium.